Hello, everyone. Welcome back to King's Hammer Speaker Series. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are here with Sky Eddie Bruce, former professional player, collegiate and youth All-American goalkeeper, and state champion track athlete. She is the founder of Soccer Parenting Association, a businesswoman, a soccer parent, and so much more. We're super excited to have her here with us virtually tonight. If you have any questions for Sky this evening, feel free to drop them in the chat box wherever you are viewing this or you can use the hashtag KH speaker series. We will try to get to as many questions as we can tonight. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Sky. Take it away. Thanks so much, Katie. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here with King's Hammer and have this chance to interact and engage a bit with parents, with players, with coaches. Um, I'm really, really excited about this next hour that we have. And I certainly welcome all your conversations um, questions. So certainly pop them into the various chats and we will work to get to them at the end. Go ahead and share my screen and pop right into this presentation. Excellent. So um, the mission at Soccer Parenting uh, is to inspire players by empowering parents. And so with that in mind, as we have players and we have parents listening, players, we want you to feel inspired by the game. I want you to think a little bit about what that means to you. Parents, think about that as well. And parents, we want you to understand the power that you have to make sure that your child is feeling inspired. The, give you some tools, some thoughts, some um, ideas, some resources for you to reach uh, sort of into a toolkit for yourself so that you can make sure that your child is feeling inspired by their uh, soccer experiences. What I want us all to walk away with today is parents, I want you to have clarity on why our children play sports. Players, I want you to have some thoughts and some ideas around your why in terms of why you spend the time on the practice fields, why you're committed to your team. Um, I want us to all have a commitment to within ourselves to ask better questions. We'll dive into that thought in just a little bit. I also want to just drive a deeper understanding regarding what your key responsibilities are as a soccer parent. Um, and I know that we all receive a lot of mixed messages about how to get involved and how not to get involved, to be the helicopter, not to be the helicopter parent, to be more engaged. So I want us to drive some clarity around the idea of what as soccer parents, our key responsibilities are. I also want us to develop just a growing awareness collectively about sideline behavior and how that sideline behavior is impacting our children and their experiences. We're gonna layer this entire conversation into the five values that King's Hammer pushes out, respect, leadership, passion, integrity, and creativity. And we'll touch on each of these values as we dive into the conversation this evening. Let me start a little bit with my story and how I ended up here. Um, I grew up in the game, so I grew up playing. I was a youth All-American. I was on our youth national team programs through ODP, um, which, you know, I'm sort of dating myself there. But when I was growing up, there really wasn't a national team like we have. We didn't have like this U17 World Cup. So essentially, I was a youth All-American, which pushed me on to the youth national team. I was also a multi-sport athlete. I did gymnastics very competitively growing up until about seventh grade. And then I um, also was a track athlete all through high school. Um, I played collegiately at the University of Massachusetts. I transferred. I played my last season at George Mason. The team at George Mason was just an incredible year. Um, we made it to the national championship game, lost in the finals to Chapel Hill. Um, and that year I was MVP of the final four and I was a first team American collegiately um, I went on to play professionally many years later because there wasn't a pro team in a pro league in the United States when I graduated from college. But I am so also very proud of my professional experience. So I have all this playing experience and I've also always been a coach. I'm a USSF B licensed coach. Um, I'm a grassroots coach educator for U.S. soccer. I work in, with United Soccer Coaches in their goalkeeping curriculums and do education as far as that's concerned. And coaching has always been a big part of my life. I'm even a coach now. This is me coaching um, a U10 team a couple of years ago. I still have a U10 team. Um, actually, after coaching at all levels of the game, from our national team level down to recreational with my kids, 
U10 is absolutely my favorite age. And I'm so happy to be coaching there right now. And then as my kids were coming up in the game, I started to get really, really clued into the stresses that existed in the parent coach relationship in soccer. Um, I'd always been kind of aware of this as a coach. And over the years, I had been told to, you know, kind of not deal with parents and, um, you know, try not to engage with them. And I had had some difficult parents on teams that I'd coached in the past. But as my daughter especially was coming up in the game, I really began to realize that youth soccer could be so much improved if coaches and parents and clubs were collaborating to ensure that players were inspired instead of oftentimes on opposite ends of everything. And I thought with all of my experiences as a coach, with all of my experiences playing, that if somebody was set up to be a successful soccer parent, it would be me. And then this happened. <laughs> this is my daughter, Callie, who's given me permission to talk about her in my talks all the time. Um, this is when she had just made our ECNL team at the club and the summer that she had some training to do, uh, they had sort of like fitness training. So we're away on a summer trip and I've set up this whole like place for her to do her training and she's gone through it for the very first time. She has like to do six different rotations here. She's finished the first one and proceeded to sit down on the pavement with tears in her eyes and look at me thinking that I was crazy. And it was in this moment that actually soccer parenting really, really began because it was in this moment that I became acutely aware of the fact that I was failing as a soccer parent, that I just needed more help. I needed more guidance and I needed more support. I said this quote in a podcast a while ago and it really resonated a lot with me even in that moment as I said it. And it's been something that I've reflected a lot on in the last six or eight, eight months. Um, you know, until we really do have some sincere and honest conversation about the way we've treated our children and how we've impacted them, good and bad, we'll really be missing an important part of the solution. And I think it's essential that we start to really understand as parents that we do a lot of great things. And, you know, if you talk to my daughter, she would say, Mom, you were a great parent. Um, but I can look back and I can see moments that I really could have been a lot better, that my, um, my the way I responded wasn't the way that I should have or the way I even wanted to in that moment. Or there's other things that I could have helped that could have helped her feel a little bit deeper connection to the game and feel a little bit more inspiration instead of any stress. So what are some of the issues that we have in youth sports in America? I decided as I started soccer parenting to really dive into this and to figure out and to kind of do a deep dive into this work. And I started uh, collaborating a lot with John O'Sullivan, who was your last speaker in the speaker series. And, you know, John and I are great friends and our interactions have really helped drive this great conversation with me over the years. And, you know, this is one of the topics that I really want us to think about. You know, what are some of the issues that we have in youth sports right now? And I think you hear about about these, but I know that some of you as parents, and even though those of you as players that are listening, you know, these might be kind of something you've thought about before, but never verbalized. So we it's clear and we hear a lot in the media that there's an overemphasis on winning. I say that a lot to parents and they say what well, winning is good and it's important. And I couldn't agree more. I think that winning is a lot of fun as an athlete. And I think that we should always have a winning mentality as we approach sports. We shouldn't be doing it, oh, just to have fun. But what fun, we need to realize that having that winning mentality, for some athletes who have a high performance mentality, that winning mentality is also fun. Another issue that we have in new sports in America is sideline behavior. Um, you know, this is parents that and coaches that care too much about their child's performance or the performance that's happening right in front of them. So we'll talk about that and try to dive into that, like I said, again today. Um, and then we have this quitting, the players that are quitting uh, youth sports. Um, we see actually a really large drop-off 
very interestingly, in sort of the five to six year old range after a child's just participated, maybe just for one season, they're often dropping out of sport. And you ask why. And I think a lot of that is because parents just need a little bit more education and information because they think are comparing their child maybe to the other six year old who has has three older brothers and sisters and has been out playing every day and maybe is athletically a little bit more gifted naturally. So they're comparing their child and thinking, oh, my child must just not have it or this must not be the right thing for them. So we need to work around and provide some education around why players stop playing in order to try to keep them in the sport for as long as possible. And the other topic here that I dive into a lot with soccer parenting is this lack of collaboration and trust. At Soccer Parenting, we believe that collaborative relationships between parents, coaches, players, and clubs is in the best interest of player development. And so we need to understand how we can form these collaborative relationships. And the foundation of that is trust. And in the work that we're doing with Soccer Parenting, and we're so excited that King Sammer has come on board as a Soccer Parenting Club member, we have club members all across the country and partner with them to try to bring parent engagement and education programming into the forefront of their clubs. And the foundation of all of this work that we're doing is related to trust. And that, I think, is really related to this value statement of creativity, is that we need to think outside the box with innovation and imagination. And what all the research says about trust, and when I'm talking to organizations about trust, we look at organizations that have trust-filled relationships and what some of the um, what some of the results or what some of the behaviors in those organizations are. And innovation and imagination is what the research says is near the top of the list for organizations that are trust-filled. So if we can dive into establishing these trust-filled relationships, um, then I think we're going to be really honing in on this value statement that you all have related to creativity. And one way that we need to think outside the box is to realize that parents are actually an important part of the solution. And that's not always been at the forefront of people's minds. Um, a lot of times I'm talking to coaches and even me myself in coach education school, as I was coming, as I was, um, you know, growing as a coach and developing as a coach over the years, you know, I was told to ignore the parents, <laughs> that all parents are crazy. And what's happened is that we do have some parents that kind of are out of control in the work that I do with soccer parenting. I call them crazy crazy soccer parents. And, you know, these crazy soccer parents have taken up way too much attention. Um, and really what's happened is two primary things is that, I mean, the last thing that we want to be thought of as a level headed, but sometimes stressed parent is put into that category of being a crazy parent. So too often, we're not asking the questions that we think we should ask, or we're curious about something, but we don't follow up, or we don't follow our instincts because we're really fearful of being portrayed as a crazy soccer parent. And then on the other side of that, with coaches, is that it's been much easier for them to just think and believe that all parents are crazy, uh, and we're just going to push them over there and not work with them. And so the flip of that is really understanding that parents are an important part of the solution when it comes to player inspiration and making sure that players are inspired and um, and that not all parents are crazy parents, but many of them are level headed and yet sometimes stressed. And I know that for me personally, I felt that stress a lot as a soccer parent. Um, I said on a podcast the other day, and <laughs> this was like the one clip that got pushed out on the podcast on social channels. So it was a little embarrassing, but it is true. I cried more than one time talking to my child's coach, talking to my daughter's coach as she was growing up. Raising my daughter specifically was really stressful. Part of that was because of my personality and that we were very different in terms of athletic mentality. But also part of that is because Callie is this extremely athletic athlete, but who was really struggling to have a stronger mentality. Maybe that's because I was 
putting too much pressure on her. There's a lot of factors into why that would be the case. But raising my daughter was stressful. And there was more than one time that I cried talking to the coach. But we're not all crazy. We're actually a part of the solution. And that's being creative and thinking outside the box and kind of flipping the script, if you will, on the way that historically parents have been perceived and been thought of. I think that we need, like I said earlier, one of the things that I want us to accomplish tonight is to dive into this idea of asking better questions. And this is a quote from my friend, Marco Sullivan, who's working at AIK in Sweden. Um, he's doing some phenomenal work when it comes to research of skill acquisition. Um, and you know, this is something he said to me, you know, we're all looking for answers answers to how our child can fall along this high performance pathway or how our child can be inspired like wh how can what are the re what are the the steps what are um what needs to be put in place for our child to be inspired by the game but what we really need to be doing instead of just looking for those answers is asking better questions and so that's how i'm going to frame this the rest of this conversation is around asking questions and i have a handful of them to propose to you all and the first is this what does inspired look like and for those players that are here i'd like you to take a moment and think about that um, if you're a parent um, you know think about what it looks like when your child is feeling inspired by the game i ask parents this a lot and I hear things usually like they are smiling when they get in the car. They can't wait to get back to practice. They're buzzing with energy. They want to tell me about practice. Um, now, I also have a 17-year-old son, so I know hearing a lot of stories about what might happen at practice is not necessarily what everyone will do. But when players are inspired and what does that sense of inspiration look like is that they're focused on the joy and instead of focusing on the problems that happened, maybe they're able to look past a struggle that they're having. Um, so I think we need to frame this idea of what inspiration looks like and really use it as sort of a reflection point, as a baseline for what we're seeking with sports. So as we kind of sometimes get off the rails and focus too much in other directions in terms of winning or making that team or this concept of fear of missing out or all of those things that might come into play that do come into play that are that are, are things that we're feeling. But as we're feeling them, instead, if we can focus on what inspires look like and have that be the goal that we have in mind. The next value that I want to talk about um, related to your King's Hammer values is integrity. And this is about doing the right thing. I wonder if you can guess what I want to talk about here. The question for you all is, I want you to ask yourselves, you know, is my sideline behavior appropriate? Is the way that I am interacting with the other parents, with my child, with the referee, with a coach, with the other players on the field, is that appropriate? And we have a lot of interventions in new sport about ideas to try to improve sideline behavior. There's uh, pre-season, there's codes of conduct that we sign, there's team managers that run around with lollipops and say, you need to suck on this lollipop instead of talking anymore. Or sometimes we do things like a silent Saturday or a silent Sunday. Um, what I have found is the most effective intervention when it comes to sideline behavior and giving parents and coaches uh, some thoughts about what's appropriate is to dive into some education about it. As a King's Hammer member, you all have, will have access and we'll give you information about this, but there is a course that you can take on my website related to sideline behavior. And after this conversation, you all will receive information about how you can register for free to gain access to this. But if you go into the courses section at the Soccer Parent Resource, Resource Center, you'll find a really important video. When I talk about sideline behavior, I think it's really important to frame it into three different types of communication. We often talk about hostile communication. We know what hostile communication is. This poor <laughs> actor who has, uh, did a couple of um, PSA announcements in the UK has become like the face of hostile communication, youth soccer. Um, but uh, you know, we know what this looks like. 
This is the unfortunate times when you yell at your child because they're just not going to the ball or they're just not working hard enough or they're not paying attention. Hostile communication is when you coach another child, when you talk to anyone else uh, on the team telling them what to do or how to play. Not appropriate. When you obviously yelling at the referee or yelling at other parents. So this hostile communication, I think all of us can get really aligned around like, oh, yeah, we know when that is. And when I talk to players and so for the players listening, um, you know, this is these are the conversations that the players are aware of, like that that dad or that mom that was screaming so much on the sidelines the whole time they were playing. Um you know, my daughter came home from a tournament once and had just a really hard conversation or a hard, told me a hard story about this parent that was specifically yelling at her during the game. My daughter's a center back. She was playing really hard against apparently this woman's mom. And the mom just really, really started screaming at her, totally inappropriate. So that type of hostile communication, I think we're really aware of. The other behavior that I think comes pretty obvious to us is supportive communication. But I think it's important that we frame supportive communication here. I also think that one of the most essential steps that parents and players can do together as you're thinking about what supportive communication is, is parents, I think you need to have a conversation with your child about what they want from you during the games. Because my daughter says, mom, even if you are telling Hannah, the goalkeeper on her club team when she was playing club, even if you're telling Hannah she just made a great save in goal, that still bothers me. It distracts me, I lose focus just when I hear your voice. So um, when I'm at Callie's games, I need to think about that. My son, however, likes to hear my voice and me supporting him with supportive communication, such as, you know, cheering after a positive outcome or offering encouragement and praise after the fact or, you know, during a stoppage in play. Um, those are things that my son actually likes to hear. And so by having an actual conversation with my child, I was able to figure out what I need to do. And so at Callie's games, I attend her games in attentive silence. I'm paying attention. I might even be like this mom when something good happens or might be like a physical show of my emotion, but I am at her games in attentive silence. I'm not on my phone. I'm paying attention and I'm supporting her silently because that's what she wants. The third type of behavior on the sidelines, I think is definitely the most confusing. And I wanna do an exercise with you all here. Um, and we'll get into it in just a second, but I just wanna kind of cue it up. So you need to be prepared to interact together with the screen and we'll go through an exercise in just a moment to try to really highlight distracting communication. And when we get into this, this is where the aha moments happen for parents, for coaches, also for players. So they can find the difference between the communication they want to hear and the communication they don't want to hear. And what is very clear about the research on distracting communication is that it impacts players' performance. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how a player feels when you're distracting them why, while they're participating in soccer. So distracting communication is things like instruction while performing. Shoot the ball, telling them what to do, throw to this person, do that. That's very distracting. It does not help with skill acquisition. Um, it might help in the moment, like you might tell your child where to throw the ball and they might do it and they might have success. But when it comes to long-term cognitive growth and their ability to perform this task on their own in the future, by telling them what to do in the moment, instead of letting them process and decide and figure things out and maybe having some reflection with them later, letting their coach have some reflection with them later, what could you have done better? What did you see? Those types of questions could happen later. Later. Also, distracting communication, what the general purpose of it is, is to alleviate the stress that we're feeling as parents and coaches while we're observing players perform. So, you know, we need to frame distracting communication. And the idea, the goal is to eliminate distracting communication from the sidelines as well. So if you think about how many times you might be talking to your child about what to do in the moment or extra communication that you might have that is trying to guide them in their behaviors, that conversation needs to end. The conversation on the sidelines really just needs to be supportive. Okay, so we're gonna dive into this exercise. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a slide up. 
This first one's gonna be very easy. It's gonna be a black screen with white words across it. And going across, I just want you to read as fast as you can all the colors that you see on the screen. Okay, so I'm gonna put it up in just a second. I, you have to do this out loud. So those of you that are listening, even if you're alone, it doesn't matter. Just say this out loud as fast as you can. Okay, you ready? All right, let's go. Keep going. Read all the way through, fast as you can. Okay, I'm thinking that you're probably, that you've probably finished by now. Um, so that was pretty easy. We're reading through. Okay, I'm gonna put another slide up. This time, the slide is going to have colors with the letters or with the words. And instead of reading the color that you see, the word, I want you to say out loud the color that the word is. So the actual color you're seeing, not the word, is what you're supposed to say out loud, okay? I'm just gonna repeat that one time so that we're clear. I'm doing a check for understanding here, which is a coaching which is a coaching thing we do, is that what you're supposed to say out loud is the color you see, not the word that you see, okay? So I'm gonna push up to the next slide. Are you ready? Go. Keep going. Okay, okay, I think that you get the feel of this. So that moment of distraction that you have, like that moment of hesitation where you're trying to say the word and you know it, but you just can't figure it out and it can't come out of your brain fast enough, that is how our children feel when they're on the field and we're telling them what to do in the moment. So this test that we just did was called the Stroop Effect Test, and it's a psychological test of cognitive ability to handle, to make a decision under stressful situations, and how we handle as adults, how we process this. This is not a test that's used generally for sideline behavior. It's usually used, you know, in a psychological setting, um, mostly testing like the performance of executive functioning. So, you know, I've just sort of taken it here. I saw Dan Abrahams, um, a sports psychologist from the UK, do this once, and I thought it was phenomenal. And so um, that moment of hesitation, again, parents, is how your child feels when they have the ball at their feet, they're trying to think about what they're going to do, they're just thinking about shooting, and you're telling them to shoot. That is what happens in their brain. So, you know, we really need to think about staying on the sidelines and just being supportive. And supportive communication is not in the moment. It's after they make the attempt to shoot, we're telling them good job. Or after they make a decision to pass and then they run, we're saying great effort. That's the type of things that we, the types of ways that we need to be communicating. So not distracting, not hostile. So when we think again about the King's Hammer um, value statement of integrity and doing the right thing, the question that I had for you is, are you doing the right thing on the sidelines? Okay, the next the next value statement that I wanna focus on is the King's Hammer value statement of passion. So this is where we're gonna think about energize, engage, and inspiring yourself and others. And when I think about passion and I think about the game, I think about this question. And this is a question for you all. Is my child having fun? I know that John O'Sullivan touched a little bit on Amanda Visick's work in his last presentation. I'm gonna dive into just a little bit of it here as we're talking about fun. So Amanda's work, and she's from Georgetown University, her fun integration theory studies actually took youth soccer players and asked them to frame what fun was. And it's a very extensive study that um, has been well documented and you can certainly find the research about it. But what happened is they came up with key indicators of what players want. And as we're thinking about what players want and what makes things fun, I want us to think about this concept that the Belgian FA, that Marco Sullivan has used quite a bit, is as many as possible, as long as possible, in the best environment as possible. And if our children are having fun, this will be the result. Even when we're talking to high level athletes, they just want to have fun. And they say that even as a professional athlete, if they're not having fun, then they won't have as much inspiration and that will probably lead them to not participating. Okay, so what do players want? The, the research study, I'm gonna kind of just dive into some of the results. They came up with 
three key indicators of what fun is to athletes. So we'll dive into each of these quickly here. So the first key one is positive team dynamics. The second one is athletes feel like they're having fun when they're trying hard. And the third one is athletes feel like they're having fun. And the fun integration series study said that one of the top key indicators of having fun is positive coaching. So let's dive into each of these. So from a positive team dynamic statement, for you athletes that are listening, think about what positive team dynamics means. And I also want you to consider what your role is in creating this positive team dynamics within, within your environment. But players, these are the uh, parents, these are the environments that we should be seeking. Coaches, this is the team dynamics that we want to create. When we're talking about team management, this is where we're trying to get. So positive team dynamics is when players feel supported by their teammates. They make a mistake, they're having a rough day, whatever that is, they're feeling supported by their teammates. Um, they're able to work through their struggle. They're playing well together. They have good sportsmanship and they're doing things together. We're going to talk about this at the end, this doing things together. We'll come back to that with sense of community. So I want you to remember that. But when we're thinking about what fun is, this is what we're thinking about. Players also have fun. One of the key indicators of fun was trying hard. So finding a way that we can try hard, and we're going to dive into this in just a second too, but exercising and being active, giving your best effort, feeling strong and confident, competing, setting and achieving goals. And we know that trying hard is not always easy. And so I want you to keep that in mind. Another thing that is really important with having fun is having positive coaching. So this is obviously a lot of the work that I dive into when it comes to coaching and the coach education work that I do around relationship building, but it's having positive and consistent communication where it's when coaches are approachable and they themselves are a good, good role model for the behaviors that they're seeking and the athletes that are on the team. Um, a positive coach compliments players. You know, one of my biggest mentors in soccer was Tony DeChico. And one of Tony's key things that he always said, in fact, the title of one of his books is this, is catch them being good. So, you know, finding the ways to compliment the athletes is positive coaching. Also allowing mistakes while staying positive. Like you haven't figured that out yet. Using the word yet, adding that in, layering that into the conversations that we have. So positive coaching, um, we know is super important. Trying hard and positive team dynamics would be the three key things with, is my child having fun? So parents and players, as you're thinking, are you having fun? You can kind of rate and think about and reflect on those three key areas that we know are the most important to athletes. The next value I wanna focus on from King's Hammer is leadership. And this is sort of empowering yourself and others to enjoy success on and off the field. So how are we going to do this? And the question here is, am I embracing the struggle? You know, I think this is a bit of a trick question for people. I'm going to go back to it. So when we say enjoying success, I think we need to frame what success is. I think we need to think about success as being player inspiration. And if we know they're having fun, they're trying hard, they're working through challenges, the question is, am I embracing the struggle? Because we need to understand that the struggle is actually where the real successes often happen. And we too often try to avoid them. So am I embracing the struggle? I love, this is my daughter. I love this picture of her. Um, randomly, one of the athletes on one of her teams when she was this age, her, her, his, her uncle was like a Sports Illustrated photographer and was at the games. And the second he saw any blood, he like ran right onto the field and started snapping pictures of her. And I'm so glad that I have this picture of my daughter so that I can recognize that in this moment, she was embracing the struggle. She got up, she took care of her injury, she went over the trainer, she handled herself, she got back out and she played. And, you know, there's some great lessons learned from our children when they do embrace the struggle, whether that be not making a team, whether that be struggling to get um, play the position that they might want, or whether that be relationships with players, um, nervousness about talking to the coach, whether, whether, you know, there's, there's so many ways that we find struggle with sport as parents is exactly why we want our children to participate. Yet in the moments, this is what we want to do. We want to protect them as much as we can, you know, and really the bottom line where we need to, when we're embracing the struggle, this is what it looks like. Our child is out in the wild. They're in the jungle. 
you know, I say that to my children, it's time to jungle today. Like it's time for us to rally and, you know, things aren't going to be easy. You have to like find your own food and you might get hurt walking across, you know, the log, it might move, it might tip over, whatever that is, but that is embracing the struggle. And again, that's where our children learn so much. The next thought for this is us uh, as parents, as players, like, are, are they leading the way? You know, and that's a great question for us to ask ourselves. Is my child leading the way? I can tell you that in this moment, Callie was not, or I was, I was leading the way. Callie was not leading the way. And I was dictating way too much. And I'm so grateful for the work that I've done with soccer parenting, the hundreds of people that I've interviewed, all of the learning and reflection that's happened for me personally, so that I could understand that she really needed to lead the way, but it really wasn't easy for me. So this is Bishop's Wood. This is the camp in Maine where I grew up going, my brother grew up going, Callie and her brother, my son Davis have been campers here since they were five years old. It's an amazing place in Maine. And Callie wanted to be a counselor in training. She had been a camper for 10 years and it was her year to be a CIT. It was just going into her junior year of high school, which if you're a parent of a player that's older and has aspirations of playing collegiate, collegiately, you know that the junior year summer is usually a pretty rec important recruiting time. So Callie wanted to be a CIT. And it was a really, really hard decision for me as much as I knew, and I wanted her to be a CIT too. I knew that she was giving up some uh, opportunities for being recruited by attending camps and putting herself out there in front of college coaches. But I let her lead the way. And actually this was probably the culmination of like my big learning journey as far as all of this is concerned. And something I think that is so funny is, and I wrote about this for soccer parenting, but the end of the article is just where I was at this moment. And now if I look back on that article four years later, I just have a laugh because what happened is on her way to go be a CIT, we stopped off at a couple of different schools for recruiting trips or just for her to meet the coaches and do an ID camp or two. And these were coaches that I actually, two of them I actually knew just from my playing time, they were still in the game. Um, and one of them who I really, really trust looked at me and said, you know, as they're talking about Callie and she, or as they're talking to Callie and she's talking about it, she can't wait to be a camper. And, you know, they're saying things were like, you know, most kids your age are like training all summer. They're not going to be in the woods in Maine for eight weeks. And Callie, you know, kind of pushed back on that. And I remember one of the coaches afterwards said, you know, maybe Callie should go play division three. And in the article I wrote, I laughed at the coach saying, like, you know, just let kids have their own experiences. Not everyone has to fall on the same path. And interestingly enough, Callie ends up going to Division Three. So this is probably like what she's trying to say without saying it out loud. Because if you asked her in that moment, she'd be like, no, I want to go to Division One. I don't want to go to Division Three. And now she's thriving. She played every minute of every game as a freshman. She's a captain as a sophomore. She's having just the time of her life collegiately, and it's the perfect environment for her. And it took me so many lessons to realize. It took me so many years to realize so much learning had to take place for this to, for me to uh, really, really, truly just step back and let her lead the way. And I'm so proud of the experiences that she's having and the way that she's able to interact with the game right now um, because she finally found an environment that suits her perfectly because we didn't put too much pressure on her. So the last value I wanna talk about here is this concept of respect. And this is treating every person with dignity and respect. And this is one of my favorite things to talk about with soccer parenting. And this is my question for you all related to respect. Am I doing my part to create a positive sense of community within the team? And sense of community theory is some very important and very cool research about how we establish a sense of community within our sporting organizations and the key role that parents play in doing that. And so that's my question to you when it comes to respect and respecting each other is, are you doing your part 
to establish a sense of community? Are you, are you forming relationships with other parents? Are you going out of your way? And I know it's a challenge with COVID right now, but to provide opportunities for the athletes on the team, the players to interact outside of training. Are we doing things like having birthday parties? Because I know for me growing up, my club team were my best friends. We went to everyone's birthday parties. We kept in touch with one another. This was a very strong, tight community and wonderful team that I had. And things are different now. I get that. There's a lot more, you know, player movement amongst teams and clubs and our teams that just sort of happens these days. And I understand that there's more opportunities. The game's grown. But we still, as parents, need to be extremely intentional about doing our part to create a sense of community within the team. That is good for us too. I mean, some of my favorite um, friends right now are our parents of soccer players that my children grew up with. So my last question for you all when it comes to respect is are you doing your part to create a positive sense of community? So I just wanted to wrap up here with just a little bit of information. Like I said, you all will receive an email with how you can join in to our community at Soccer Parenting. I'm so excited that King's Hammer has this resource. I have this URL at the bottom, but you're going to get an email um, through your communication channels, through the club, um, through Playmaker, just after this, where you'll find information with how you can register. I know that there are a couple of questions. Hopefully you all were thinking of some as we went through that, and we'll take a moment to answer some questions as well. Awesome, that was so fun to listen to. I just, all your stories and examples, <laughs> they just added so much color. Oh um, yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey. I mean, and a great one too. Like it's so easy to, for me to dive into this stuff and to make it seem like I was a really obsessive parent and I absolutely <laughs> wasn't. But having this ability to say, oh, this is something, This is, there's something bigger here, or this happens a lot. And to have those experiences myself that I've been able to layer into the work I'm doing has been, it's been fun too. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, we are gonna dive. We have like six questions so far and we'll see if we continue to, to get some here. But um, okay, first question. So you touched on this a little bit, but can you elaborate on your journey from playing in high school to deciding to play in college? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so I remember uh, Jill Ellis's dad was my coach. Uh, he like came in and did a summer camp training thing for her. He was like a trainer for our team. I mean, this is way back in the day. This is, this is really before there was ever a, uh, college soccer championship. Maybe this is like the mm -hmm. first year that the NCAA started having, cause I'm like in seventh grade. And I will never forget that John Ellis looked at me and said, you need to, you need to aspire to get a scholarship to college to play soccer. And I was like, what, you know, <laughs> I mean, I was like in middle school, I wasn't even thinking about college yet, but I went back to my parents and, um, and I told them that he said that. And I made them promise me that they'd buy me a car if I got a scholarship to college. They never did that, and I'm still holding it against them. But um, but the journey from high school to college, um, I mean, it was always clear that that's what I wanted to do. And especially being at a high level at that point, you know, already being in our national team programs at level, it was really obvious that I was going to continue to play. Although I did think a lot about running track in college as well and trying to do multiple sports. Um, I eventually just settled on soccer and happily did. Um, but, you know, the recruiting process was a little bit different. None of us committed until our end of our, like the mi middle to end of our senior year. Um, but it was also really th thrilling. My transition from high school to college was really, really hard, though. I really struggled um, emotionally. I was so used to being like the athlete that everyone knew, the state champion track athlete, the soccer player, the this, the that. And I got, it was just like one of so many. And it was a really, really hard experience for me. Um, so I always am cautious or thoughtful about trying to ac just provide extra support to athletes at that transition point. It's, it's really is a challenging thing. Yeah, I'm sure. Do you have any like specific advice that comes to mind for our kids who are making that transition? Absolutely. Um, one is I think you need to seek help. <laughs> like, like it's okay that you're struggling 
And obviously what we know now about mental performance and the resources that are available to athletes is quite extensive. But, you know, if I could do it all again, I would really personally as an athlete, just focus on the joy. Last week at Soccer Parenting was Gratitude Week. And we had a sports psychologist, Jerry Lynch, on the show talking about gratitude and how gratitude is actually like foundational to being a high performing athlete, like being grateful for the opportunities you have and Instead of comparing yourself to others. And I was a goalkeeper. The other goalkeeper on the team was Brianna Scurry. So we split time over. And for those of you listening who might be so young, you don't know who Brianna was. She was the goalkeeper in like the 99 World Cup that saved the PK. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, she's a phenomenal athlete. And so she and I were competing head to head for a number of years in college. And so I was always going back and comparing myself to her crying in my dorm room every night and Bri being so strong immensely, she just was moving on. She was just full of gratitude and full of joy. And I was like having it on. So I would say, keep a big picture of it. Focus on forming great relationships with your teammates and being an exceptional teammate and um, let all the playing happen just as it will. I love that. Um, okay. So still diving in on you a little here. Um, what was your experience as a youth player? And did you have any parents or coaches that really stood out and, and impacted your journey? Yes, absolutely. Um, probably the coach that had the most impact on me was actually my track coach, Mr. Dobson, who I talk about a lot. Um, Mr. Dobson, um, you know, we, 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 think about, you know, what quality coaching looks like. And it's obviously, obviously coaches that have the ability to form really strong relationships and who really care. And, um, you know, Mr. Dobson was always there and supportive of us and um, really stood out to me as somebody that I wanted to be like. And so when I got into coaching, you know, that behavior, that connection, um, that sense of caring about the athletes that I was working with was something that was really prevalent. Um, and the other coach that had a huge influence on me was Tony, as I mentioned. So Tony DiCicco, I worked for Tony for 15 years as a director for Soccer Plus on and off. And, um, you know, Tony was the most winning coach in U.S. soccer. Jill Ellis just kind of beat him out of that. But um, unfortunately, he passed away a handful of years ago. But his influence on my life and on so many coaches is goes so deep. And I would say that my tribute to Tony is the education that I do about emotional intelligence and coaching. So he was so emotionally intelligent, so self-aware, uh, had such great self-management and social awareness and team management. Um, those are things that I always aspire to. And then I have to like call out my parents too, because, you know, they were always involved, but not over involved. Um, my mom would probably fill in that like attentive silence that I spoke about. Um, she really modeled that really well. Although sometimes she was focusing on her crossword puzzles more than me. <laughs> she was so stressed because I was a goalkeeper and she was afraid that I was going to get hurt. So her, her coping mechanism was, was crossword puzzles, but <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Um, I just have a question for you. I um, remember as a young athlete, my parents always kind of felt like I needed to put all my energy into one sport. It was like, how can you be the best at one thing if you're also doing, you know, four other sports? I'm mm -hmm. curious, like your thoughts on that. And when do you think it's appropriate to try to like narrow down the interests that they may have? Is it appropriate? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of this depends on um, a bit depends on the level that you're playing. So at some point, you'll probably reach a moment where you do have to make a decision or where you'll be pulled in so many directions that you need to have a primary sport. I do think that there's incredible benefit to multiple sports participation. Not so much that we have to get our kids involved in multiple sports. They need to be over scheduled or anything like that, but just related to kind of like functional movement skills and um, our ability to overcome injury or not be injured related to our other skills and movements that we might acquire from other sports. So I think that there's, um, you know, an important factor that we need as parents to consider there. And then for me as an athlete, um, I was one of those kids that like got to school at 
six 30 in the morning to do my track workout so that I could play soccer after school and then drove across town to my club practice stayed up till midnight and did all my homework. Like mm -hmm. it is not necessarily the best way to go about things. Cause I was tired and I'm sure that you look, I can look back on some injuries or different things like that, um, mm -hmm. that were maybe related to that. So it's just finding that balance, but it's also finding the joy. And then I also want to say that, you know, at, if you're not participating at a super high level, then the, the more sports, the more participation, and the more activity. And when I say super high level, I mean, I think it's possible to, you know, maintain um, participation in a number of sports if, if you want. Um, I don't feel like you have to have multiple sports participation as long as as a parent, we're being thoughtful about making sure our kids are moving appropriately and able to learn and acquire those movement skills. That's foundational. And I obviously talk to coaches a lot about that as well. Mm -hmm. You know, we kind of miss that boat in the four, five, six, seven, eight year old range of functional movement because the kids aren't learning. I mean, I was at a session, I tell the story a while ago with, with top level goalkeepers. These are national team level goalkeepers. And I had worked with them with, for a few days. And so I was like, just going out to do a fun warm up. And I was like, we're going old school. And I pulled out a warm up that I used to do. And I love like growing up. And they have to do a forward roll. These are national potential national team level goalkeepers. And of the four of them at the camp, only one of them knew how to do a forward roll. <laughs> and I just sat there and I went, or stood there and went, how are you gonna be a top level goalkeeper if you don't know how to move your body like this? Like the proprioception and stuff. So I think there's, you know, important things that we learn from other yeah. sports that, you know, layer in. And that just factors into, you know, being a healthy adult mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. that. Um, but I know it's a big decision for kids if they're trying to decide about which sport they're going to focus on. And um, my brother still tells the story and he's mad that my parents made him stop playing soccer to focus on gymnastics because he was a high, high level gymnast. And he's like, why mm -hmm. did they make me quit? So it's a it's a tough decision that we make as a family. And it's often factored into other kids that we have and time constraints and such. But it is one that we need to be really thoughtful about. Mm hmm. Yeah, I have that same sort of scarring memory of having to choose. So yes, I get that. I'm telling you, like I didn't get the car, and I talked to my parents all the time about that. My brother's still like, "You made me quit soccer." Like yeah. things we hold against your parents. So, you know, absolutely. So. <laughs> um, okay, on I think this question is geared towards like younger players, but. Mm -hmm what is the line between letting them lead the way versus encouraging them to stay committed to sport? Yeah, this is, this is, I, I, I run into this a lot. Um, especially also with the age that I'm coaching now, like this nine year old, you know, I think it's really important that we guide and lead and that athletes, even at these young ages can learn important skills like goal setting. And so, what I often talk about is the importance of at the beginning of a season, parents sitting down with their child to say, you know, what are your goals? And having those goals be some process related, um, you know, in terms of maybe what they're going to do, like this extra training or, you know, our goal, like me, it's skill acquisition related, like I want to juggle this many juggles by the end of the summer. So let's just use juggling as an example, because I think it's an easy one. So if your child sets that goal that by the end of the winter break, they want to be able to juggle 25 times, and then they're not following through on that, I think that's a moment that we can step in and give some advice. I talked to Kelly Polisic about this, Christian's mom, um, and did an interview with her on Soccer Parenting about how they went through this process with Christian, who was just incredibly internally motivated, as you can imagine. But um, I think that was an interesting interview. And what I learned from that conversation with Kelly was, you know, the importance of the lesson that isn't always easy. And, you know, like, are you letting your kids struggle? And sometimes letting them struggle is making them accountable to the goals that they set. And those are great life lessons that we can learn through that. Absolutely. Okay, we are shifting a little here. Um, question about um, soccer parent resource center. How can Kingshammer parents make the most use out of that? 
Oh, great question. I'm so excited that you all are coming on board as a club member. And um, I'm positive that parents and coaches having access to this education hub that I've established and created will really, really help. So they'll receive an email right after this or a communication from you all through your communication channels with the club right after this with how they gain access. So you just log in, you create a password, username, um, and then you have access to an, this very education rich website full of information about how um, the, the topics we write about are parenting itself, the co club, coach relationship, um, the body, the mind, the game itself, and like the next level, whatever that might be for your child. So hop into the library, um, which is where the majority of the content is housed, and you can search by topic or you can search by the type, whether it's an article, a long form interview, a quick breakaway video, um, soccer talk, specifically diving into things with the game. So definitely hop into the library, check out our breakaway section. So just as like a teaser, my, and one of my favorite things on the site is this breakaway that we just create, or is this, um, is this game plan, sorry, that we just created about motivation. So if you wanna learn more about motivation and what the research says behind that and how you can support your child in developing a stronger sense of motivation and just learn about that as a parent, dive into that game plan where you'll find it. It's kind of a learning journey for parents. So definitely I would chime in in those areas. There's a community that's just taking off. So these forums that we started, introduce yourself there. I'm always popping into the community to say hi to people and to connect. So if you have any questions, it's a great place to ask them. Amazing. This was just so awesome. I feel like I could just keep talking to you all night. <laughs> we are sort of at our time here. So thank you, Sky, so much for all of your thoughts and awesome stories. And thank you everyone who joined us virtually for our second speaker series. Um, we have our third one coming up on Thursday, April 15th at seven o'clock. Um, which will be with Yael Averbush. So we hope everyone will join us then for that. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone.